Hello, Sean. Can you hear me? Are you on mute? Yeah, sorry. There we go. So uh, we'll get started here in just a minute. We're waiting for uh, oh, noon to roll around here. Are you on the East okay. Coast or the West Coast? East Coast. All righty. And for participants who are joining now, please go ahead and get your questions in the Q&A section or in the chat box, and we'll get your answers, questions answered here shortly. So just give us a minute. Thanks for joining us. All righty. Well, it's noon. Welcome to the Big Apple Film Festival uh, Film Distribution Summit. I'm Lavender Gill. I host the Script Cake Podcast, and we are honored to have our guest here, uh, Sean Flanagan. Sean, would you just take a minute to, in your own words, give us a little background on yourself? Yeah, absolutely. It's, uh, it's great to be here. Uh, so I am a writer and producer myself, and when I was struggling to figure out how to get into the industry, I realized what I needed to do was kind of, you know, frankly, be the smartest person in the room and learn what nobody else seemed to understand when I was out there on, on the festival circuit, which was marketing and distribution. So I quite literally, I started at the bottom uh, office receptionist at a distribution company rose pretty quickly to marketing manager. Um, so I've worked on all kinds of uh, distribution, theatrical, educational, VOD. Um, from there, I went and became the head of multiple aggregation companies. So I was pitching and delivering content for clients like Sundance, Pokemon, Funimation, uh, selling directly to Netflix and Hulu and all the big SVOD guys. And now, you know, after doing that, releasing over a thousand films, I'm sort of trying to go back to the beginning and help filmmakers understand what the actual business model is so that they can succeed when they're making their own films. Well, that is uh, incredibly needed. <laughs> I'm somebody who went to my first American film market recently and just had my eyes open incredibly wide because, you know, there's two sides of this equation. You're the creative side. But then there's the business side. And it sounds like that you had the creative side down and you went out and learned the business side. So can you tell me a little bit about, you know, what are some uh, recommendations you would make to filmmakers um, who want to learn how to distribute and market their films? Yeah, um, there's like you said, there's a lot of it. And um, unfortunately, there there tends to not be a lot of easy right answers or even that many wrong answers. You just kind of have to be aware of the marketplace and just pay attention to what other people are doing. What's working, what's not working. You know, have you heard of that film? Do you like their campaign? What spoke to you about that campaign? Is there something you can take from their campaign and sort of roll it into your own project? Um, you know, the, the marketplace is fickle and there's a lot of content out there. So a lot of the, the battle in normal distribution is just cutting through all the noise of all the films being released and actually getting in front of the audience. Uh, you know, an audience can't find your film, buy your film, watch your film if they never find it. Mm -hmm. So it's just, how do, you, how do you find an audience and just keep talking to them? Yeah, it seems like, every few years the the market is changing now you know the way you sold a film maybe even four or five years ago is not the same now because everything is changing what do you see as the current trends for independent producers to stay on top of um so one thing that i've i've watched change in you know like you said a few years very real time is you know chasing netflix used to be the number one thing I heard of before COVID, you know, a couple of years before COVID, uh, everybody came in and said, I want to be on iTunes. I want to be on Netflix. I want to make a lot of money. Go. And it's like, it, it was never that easy back then. And, you know, quite frankly, neither of those things are relevant now. iTunes transactional rentals are a dying market because there's so many subscription-based platforms, you know, I, I have 12 on my TV right now. So why would I ever go to iTunes to pay to rent a movie? And Netflix, you know, as 
I'm sure everybody's aware, they're spending so much money making their own original content that they're very rarely buying a truly independent film. Hmm. So what is going on right now, and you probably can find a lot of articles that think it's, you know, the second coming is AVOD, uh, like Tubi and Pluto. Filmmakers are making more money from certain windows than ever before. And most distributors are aware of that. So one thing as a filmmaker to keep in mind is, you know, you might have a vision of, I want to be on a big screen. I want to see my name on a big screen. I want to do all the normal things. I want to go get all the festival awards. And then I want to be on Netflix so that, you know, my grandma is proud of me. And a lot of those things just, they don't exist as an actual business model anymore. You know, you go where the audience is, you go where the path of least resistance is. And right now, one of the big elements to that is AVOD um, because it's free to the consumer, which means they're more willing to experiment and maybe give an opportunity to a film they're not totally aware of. Mm -hmm. So this, you know, let me give a shot. That looks cool. The poster's cool. The log line's cool. As opposed to, you know, buy me for $12 on iTunes, even though you've never heard of any of our cast members and you don't know whether or not you trust me as a filmmaker. Like th those days are gone. <laughs> yeah. It seems like uh, YouTube and even Netflix are starting to experiment with AVOD. Is that true? Um, it's definitely everybody's trying to experiment in it or say they're experimenting in it. What what's exciting if you're on the business side and probably less so if you're a filmmaker is when you have such large companies like Netflix, they move at a glacial pace. So they might be saying, you know, I think it was six months ago, maybe they were actively saying, hey, Vod could be interesting. But by the time you implement it in a company that has hundreds of millions of subscribers and a hundred plus territories, you know, I, I'd be shocked if they were really doing AVOD in a significant way in two years. And honestly, by then, you know, who knows where Netflix will be or what the new trend will be. So there's a chance they just throw it out altogether and they try to get ahead of whatever's after AVOD instead of trying to catch up to you know, Tubi is doing phenomenal and Pluto and a couple other people are sort of nipping at their heels. Right. So it just, these big guys can't move fast enough to necessarily keep up with the trends. So for independent producers that are developing projects or have something that they've shot, um, you know, let's say without a massive name in it, what do you suggest is the best method for them to uh, try to get distribution for their product, for their project? Um, in terms of finding distribution, uh, I know you can't retroactively do this, but genre is a huge one. Mm -hmm. Knowing what making a movie that the market is actually asking for is a big one. And, you know, hindsight's 2020, but there's a reason why there's always more independent thrillers or horror or sci-fi that sort of break out as opposed to say an indie comedy or an indie love story maybe where you know the ones that are big that people talk about are based in the talent so doing a movie where it's like well we think we're really funny but you don't know any of these people distributors are very lazy and they they want an easy sale mm -hmm. so trying to trying to make the next rom-com be a breakout hit with no talent is probably more work than they're going to want to do. Mm -hmm. Whereas in a, let's say a horror, you just need a great name, a great poster, a great log line or a hook. And then all of a sudden people are going to say like, Oh, that sounds cool. I could see that. I want that. I want that next Halloween, mm -hmm. you know, shutter and Tubi and everybody curates for a Halloween holiday. So as long as you've got a good poster, you know, you're going to catch people's eye. Are there any recent films that you can you know, come to mind that kind of meet that criteria that you set forth? Um, trying to think of uh, 
this goes back a ways, but Paranormal Activity and Blair Witch are always the two sort of apexes just because they broke out so big mm -hmm. that they basically created their own sub-genre movements. Right. Um, more recently, Terrifier 2 right now is a great example. The first one was a bizarre little gory horror movie that built a cult following. They made a sequel for... I believe it was about $250,000 and it's made millions at the box office. And it just, there's a very clear image. It's a disturbing clown. They had good press where there were articles in all the papers saying like audience faints and vomits at the, the horror and the gore of Terrifier 2. And then it just, it created a, a word of mouth that, you know, Cinedime when they were putting that movie in theaters, they probably said, eh, it's Halloween. Let's see if we get a bite. We know there's an audience that likes the first one. Mm -hmm. And they're they're basically taking it to the bank. Mm -hmm. uh, someone recently told me that uh, Christmas movies almost have the same type of fans that horror movies do. <laughs> do you believe that? And is Christmas yeah. a viable market? Um, it's definitely a viable market. There's just different ways you would go about engaging with it. Again, Every Christmas, you know, there's 80 new Lifetime movies. There's 100 new Hallmark movies. Like, they want the new content. But as opposed to, say, trying to do a small theatrical and having the, the buzzy poster and all that, you know, you're very much, I think, you're chasing, how do I get on Hallmark? How do I get on Lifetime? How do I get it on those places or into those places that people are looking for Christmas movies? Um, you probably could do a truly independent Christmas movie. You got a great poster and say one sort of D-list TV name to put on the poster and put it on Tubi and just hope it catches fire. Mm -hmm. But it'd be a little bit more of a gamble as opposed to actively chasing, say, the Hallmark model. Okay. Yeah. With channels like Tubi and Freebie, um, it seems like there's just a ton of stuff that's being... I don't want to say dumped on there, but, you know, uploaded to those to those locations. How competitive is it? And, you know, what kind of return? Is it just a luck of the draw? What kind of return can people expect? Um, there is a lot being, you know, dumped is, a, it's the right word. It just, it'd be lovely if it had a better connotation. <laughs> um, yeah, I mean, again, it's, it's just cutting through the noise and trying to, you know, if you had a film on Tubi is promote it, say, you know, we're free, go find us. You've already probably got Tubi. If not, you should check it out. Um, but I've, I worked on films that are making tens of thousands of dollars a month from Tubi, hmm. you know, cause it quite literally, so Tubi's model is there's what say nine ads in a movie. Mm -hmm. usually cut at awful places where they have no context of, uh, you know, cinema. You know, it's the middle of an action scene and all of a sudden there's a, an <laughs> ad for Prilosec. <laughs> but um, every time the audience makes it through one of those ads, you're getting usually about 50% of whatever the, the sponsor paid to put the ad there. So it literally just becomes, an, you know, if somebody watches your entire movie, and say what well, gets nine commercials you're getting half of the the ad rate on nine commercials so it can add up quickly and again more people are willing to experiment and give an indie movie a try because it's free there's literally no risk you know i've for better or worse i probably started 50 movies on tubi this year where i was like you got me with the poster you got me with the log line i wonder if this is any good and, you know, maybe I turn it off after 10 minutes if I realize it's not for me, or maybe I just let it go and start puttering, you know, around the house. Um, but, you know, frankly, in terms of revenue, as long as you're making it to that next ad break, you're making more money. Okay. And just a reminder to our attendees, you can put your questions in the Q&A box or into the chat box. Um, what particular genres do you think are most effective on these uh, AVOD channels? Um, you know, again, unfortunately, it's, it's almost always horror, horror thriller. Um, but
but uh, one exercise I always love telling filmmakers is pretend you're sitting on your couch on a Friday night and you're scrolling through virtually any VOD platform right now. When you're scrolling, you've got a poster and a title mm -hmm. and that's what you're hooking people with. So like, do you have a provocative poster? Do you have a provocative title? You know, do you know what you're going to get? Like, Texas Chainsaw Massacre is not, you know, a family rom-com. But if it's a really generic title um, and you, you don't know, is that action, is that comedy, is it something? It's like, it's really easy to scroll past because once you've got the provocative poster of the title and you click through, then you get to hook them with your log line. Mm -hmm. And you're like, oh, okay, this is what it's about. I would, my assumption based on the poster was correct. If you got, if you're hooked on the log line, ideally you'll say, well, let me watch the trailer and see if it looks good. Mm -hmm. And that's when, you know, now you've got two minutes to actually show them your movie. And then after that, you either have to rent, purchase, stream, or walk away. So you really only have the assets of poster, title, log line, trailer, if you're lucky. Mm -hmm. um, and then people have to do it or not. Right. So being clear, being provocative, you know, there's documentaries out there that do insane amount of money because mm. they're either sexy or it's true crime or it's something that gets your attention and you're like, wow, I want to watch that. You just need a wow factor no matter what you're doing. It's just a lot easier to have a wow factor when it's either sex, drugs, rock and roll or violence. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I know when uh, my wife and I are streaming through like Netflix or something like that, it seems like every other show is a thriller, you know, dark thriller from a different country <laughs> or from here. Yeah. <laughs> They're very popular. And which uh, is awesome. I mean, I love seeing foreign content actually make a mark in the US audience. And I think that's the probably one of the best things that streaming has given us mm -hmm. is letting audiences actually be hooked by you know, a squid games or a 365 days and not just say, ew, subtitles. Right. Because, you know, 20 years ago, I had to drive like an hour to a movie theater, you know, three towns over to find the movie with the subtitles that I had read about from, you know, Focus or IFC or one of those brands that are known for more global content. And now yeah, it's like right there. I was talking to a producer at AFM and they said that it's because the production value is so much better on the foreign films that people are willing to sit through subtitles. What do you think about that? Because, you know, I guess historically it wasn't what we were used to. Yeah. Um, yeah. I mean, when you look at something like Squid Games, like if if the production quality is there, then yeah, you're you might be a little bit more willing to forgive. I feel like I've seen just as many very low quality, you know, it looks like an SD project from 10 right. years ago, where it's like, God, I don't know if I can get through this. Or Netflix is definitely guilty of this. You know, you start seeing a bad dub. Mm -hmm. And you're just like, oh, God, I, I can't listen to like, you know, it's out of sync, the dubbing's bad. And then you start to see these articles where they're dubbing the dialogue and dumbing the characters down. Right. Like, well, I'd just be better off not. Okay. Um, but yeah, I mean, if the vision's there, the production quality, like audiences are getting smarter, whether you're a foreign filmmaker or a U.S. filmmaker, you know, you, you know what looks good. You know what your eyes are going to want to watch for an hour and a half. Or after five minutes, if you can't take it, you know, odds are it's not going to get better. Right, right. Um, let's flip that around. What are the options for independent producers uh, in, in foreign territories? Um, <laughs> uh, in, in a lot of ways, it's very much um, like here. You know, it's finding the right distribution partner. Um, to me, I, I think it's more when you're looking for a distribution partner, you want to find somebody who's aligned and has a proven track record at what's important to you. Mm -hmm. You know, it's a hundred percent valid for you to say, I need theatrical. I'm not worried about blank or, 
you know, I, I've worked on many films, uh, usually documentaries, where they're like, almost our entire budget is grants. We essentially don't have an investor. We are not worried about paying people back. We mm -hmm. are worried about getting to the largest audience possible. And I've similarly had filmmakers who are like, my investors will break my knees if I'm not giving them a lovely check every quarter. So you have to look at, you know, if theatrical is important to you, great. If, you know, you are a film that's got great global appeal and you sign with a distributor has, who has almost no track record of foreign sales, then odds are you're not gonna see much come out of the foreign markets. Okay. So usually again, as you're looking at a distributor, the best thing you can do is go look at their catalog, go look and see where their films are available, where they've been available in the past. Um, are they doing theatrical? Do they work in the genre that your film is? You know, I wouldn't bring, uh, you know, a documentary about the women's fashion industry to Shudder or terror films or epic pictures. Like you want to find somebody who understands you and mm -hmm. then actually does, does what you want them to do. Um, yeah. Otherwise, you're, you're going to sign the deal because it looks good and then started asking questions six months later and be like, why didn't you do that? I was like, oh, yeah, we, we don't want to do that. We're over at. Right. No, I had and a real awakening. Late. I'm sorry. By that point, it's too late. Like once you marry, you know, a partner, it's just as hard to divorce them as it is to. To marry them, if not even harder, because now they've sunk money into it. So they're right. not just going to walk away because you didn't like what they did or didn't do about, say, theatrical or DVD or educational. Right. I was going to say, I had a rude awakening after I graduated from film school because they taught me, you know, how to take a movie idea from an inception to completion. And here it is, you know, back then it was on a DVD. <laughs> but um, no idea about the business side of it. And... Um, I know you've given talks before on making your concept fit company mandates. Can you expand on that for people who are developing projects and, and wanting to get them distributed? Yeah. Um, I mean, again, it, there's a lot of moving parts, but you know, I, what I do when I'm working with a filmmaker from day one is, you know, who are you trying to sell this to? There are, there are certain financial models like, Generally speaking, you know, a Blumhouse doesn't make a $20 million big budget crazy movie. Like they have a specific financial model, which is say two to $3 million. It's not necessarily star driven. Um, and then they sort of rinse and repeat. Um, mm -hmm. Similarly, Lifetime or Hallmark, they have financial models that they rinse and repeat. So if you're, if you have an idea and you're trying to say like, what is the, what are the pillars of success in that genre's world? And then you were saying, I, I hope or aspire to bring this project to them. You have to bring something that sort of fits their business model. You don't want to bring, again, like you wouldn't bring a doc, a uh, large budget documentary to one of those people. And they're like, well, we don't know what to do with this. We either don't work in the space. The financial model doesn't make sense. Um, the assets don't make sense. We just, we don't know what to do with it. So, you know, again, once you have a goal of where you'd like to see it and you kind of start walking back and be like, well, what's their general model? Um, what's their general budget point? You know, you can't write a $5 million space opera for a company that's actively making million dollar movies. Right. Um, so it's, there is a, a way where you can kind of backtrack it to say, you know, okay, so they like murder mysteries. They generally are under this budget price point. How do I tell the story effectively um, so that I can accomplish those goals? without killing myself or killing the story. Right. Um, so, you know, one example uh, of a project I'm working on right now is, again, we wanted a, for us, it was under $700,000 because that's a SAG union tier. Um, mm -hmm. We knew we didn't want to trip any union tiers and we knew we were writing a female-led murder mystery. 
So to us, it became how few characters still makes this a viable murder mystery and how do we reduce the locations so that the physical production was, we essentially, we weren't spending money on company moves and frivolous things that wouldn't be seen on screen. We were like, how do we get these six amazing characters into one place and then let these great actors like really just chew the scenery and have fun with the actual storyline. So all of a sudden, as a writer, it was, okay, I don't want any extras. I don't want any big scenes. There's no airports. There's no hard to shoot things. Mm -hmm. It's two to three to four characters in a room doing a thing. And then you move and it's another two to three characters. Um, and you literally just, how do you tell the story in an economical way to fit that business model? In that example, is that uh, something that you went out to name cast and and package the project together? Or is that something that you uh, went out and made without name cast? Uh, so we're actually, we're in the middle of packaging that one. So again, knowing the, the business model, the budget model, where it's going, um, a lot of the names we're going to are generally TV names. Because um, in this case, a lot of TV names, you know, they're on CBS procedurals or, you know, very kind of rinse and repeat anthology type shows. They, they want feature work. They want roles that are different than what they're doing every day. Mm -hmm. so we're giving them a little bit of, you know, come play in our sandbox. It's only going to be two to three weeks for you. You're going to play something completely different in a feature world where there's a clear beginning, middle and end as opposed to, you know, the 10 month production cycle of TV. Right. And for them, that's really appealing, even though we're not offering a lot of money. So, you know, our leads are going to make 20 to 40,000 um, if they're lucky. Mm -hmm. um, but for them, you know, it's, it's a good opportunity. It takes them to a, a different place or a different level based on their career, as opposed to, you know, say, I've got a million dollar movie, but I'm going to go try to get George Clooney to do a cameo as the father. It's like, he's got no reason to do that. <laughs> as great as it was be, I would kill for that opportunity. Mm -hmm. uh, but it's just, you know, it's finding, finding actors who are available and open to the opportunity. Right. Yeah. Um, here's a question. I have a sub hundred thousand dollar thriller with a little supernatural elements, no one famous. Uh, what's the best, what do you recommend uh, the best route for distribution? Um, so yeah, I would, I would just crush the assets, um, lean into the horror element for sure. Uh, you know, put it supernatural and then thriller and then drama or any sort of subcategory, subgenre you might have. Um, but just make a great poster, make sure the the name is catchy and provocative. And then just go out there, you know, best foot forward is again, you you want to catch people's attention fast. If you're writing inquiries to a distributor, uh, taking meetings, they're gonna look at those assets and their brain from a visual standpoint is going to go, oh, I can't wait to sell that. Or, oh, I can't wait to make a lot of money off that. Um, and again, without the, without the star name, you know, it's based on what the supernatural element is. If it's a ghost story, you know, show a haunted house, show a ghost, like make it very clear from the get go what you're going to get if you spend an hour and a half in your world. Okay. All right. Um, I know one of the topics that you've spoken about before is writing with production in mind. And I think you slightly touched on that earlier with the project that you're working on currently, but can you get in a little bit more detail about that? Yeah. Um, again, it's, it's just coming down to being cognizant. Like it's great to tell these big sprawling stories, but you have to think, well, if you're interested in being more than just a writer, you have to think, you know, if you do a half a page scene in a bookstore and then a half a page in a bar and then a half a page in an airport, 
productions physically have to move from each of those locations mm -hmm. just because you wrote two lines of dialogue and a couple action slugs in that scene doesn't mean it's just a fast easy clip through you have to you have to get there you have to set it up you have to shoot it you have to wrap it out you know uh, a half a page scene is still arguably going to be a half day right. so i know because i read you know scripts from third parties and i've optioned stuff i've produced other people's work one of the things i look at as i'm going through besides being is this well written does it catch my attention um you know is a dialogue strong is there an obvious hook it's just are we actually going to be able to shoot this thing you know again i i've talked with incredibly talented writers like get me something low budget i've got people with money asking for x y or z and then they turn around and they send a period drama about a ai robot essentially a frankenstein story it's like well now i've got technology involved a period piece which involves costumes and other you know locations and elements that are harder to find it's like you know you've you submitted a $5 million movie when we were asking for a 500,000 to a million. It's like, you have to write to, you know, is this easy to shoot? You know, is it broad? Like, is it generic suburban house? Is it generic bar? Is it something that can be easily interpreted in lots of different ways while still conveying your story? Mm -hmm. um, because if you read through and you're like, Oh, a shopping mall. That means extras and permits. It's going to cost. And if that starts to add up in your brain over and over, where every time you see a, a scene like a heading slug, you tense up because you're like, oh, what are you going to do to me now? It's just, it's very easy for a producer to walk away hmm. because those things add up. And it's like every time you do it, another half a day adds to another day where it's like, well, I've got a, a good bottle film that can film in 15 days and we can crush it. Or this one wants 25 days and has 42 locations and 83 speaking roles. Right. And every one of those little details cost hundreds of dollars or thousands of dollars. And then they add up very quickly. So what are the kinds of projects someone like you or other um, similarly positioned producers uh, are always on the lookout for? Um, so this is a total contradiction to everything I just said, but <laughs> uh, besides being smart and well-written and easy to produce, uh, you have to swing for the fences and you have to have a voice and you have to have something to say. I a thousand percent would rather make a slightly imperfect movie that swings for the fences and has a voice or a character or a supporting diversity or something that I want to put into the world, then, you know, a generic middle of the road, you know, Marvel movie is like, so it's, it's really, and I still don't know. I don't think anybody could ever tell you they've perfected the formula to be like, how do you, how do you take that voice and that originality and that creative vision and then still play within, you know, the instructions from the Lego box. Right. Right. And I think that's why, you know, if it was that easy, more people would be doing it and, you know, every movie would be a grand slam. Okay. Um, this is a question I'm always trying to get an answer to. What is your definition of voice? Because it seems like it's a broad spectrum. Um, I, I mean, I think in, Films, it can be different things. Uh, I think on the surface level, sometimes it's just truly are these characters and dialogue and a world that feels totally unique where I'm physically listening to, to people that I haven't seen before. Um, I am not personally a fan, but Diablo, Cody, and Juno comes to mind. Mm -hmm where I think, you know, that was not particularly strong or appealing movie, but it was so full of original actual surface level voice 
that it stood out amongst a somewhat crowded marketplace. Mm -hmm. The other kind of subtextual version of voice is, you know, are you are you telling a story that needs to be told? Are you telling it from a point of view that hasn't been seen before or seen, you know, you're you're not always going to invent fire, but have I seen this a thousand times or have I seen it three? Because I'm probably more willing to see it for a fourth time than I am for the 1000 and first time. Um, and I think, you know, unfortunately, uh, for writers who don't always fit some of these models, I think that's why you see more film festivals going towards almost over the top diversity inclusion because they're so set on finding you know the unique voice and championing uh, a corporate mandate for inclusion mm -hmm. um that sometimes it's hard to be like well i'm not the disabled middle eastern non-binary person who escaped human trafficking it's like mm -hmm. i'm just me and i have this story to tell um so again, it's it's a crowded marketplace, but you have to have, you know, your point of view, your story, ideally in a way that you haven't seen before. Okay. Uh, we have another question, actually a couple of questions here. I made an under $700,000 drama about a biracial girl navigating the tricky world of pro skateboarding. I'm in post and preparing to submit it to festivals. How much do I say about the budget to distributors? uh as little as possible um if you've made a great there's nothing wrong with your budget or talking about your budget but you really i think what you're hoping is when you you send somebody a movie and they don't have all the background of the behind the scenes is you're hoping they see your seven hundred thousand dollar movie and they think it costs millions of dollars you, you want to wow them with the production, the visual, the storytelling, the, the acting. You want to wow them with the movie, not with, oh, yeah, no, that makes sense. That's what you pulled off for that budget. Cool. Um, because that's not going to influence how they release the film or where they try to bring the film. They're going to look at it as, you know, great diversity story about skateboarding or female-led skateboarding movie. And they're gonna look at sports films and they're gonna look at um, diversity films and female-led films. They're not gonna look at you as, what do we do with $700,000 movies? I think that information is what you need in the back of your head as you're hopefully start getting offers for MGs or like, we'll buy this or we'll sell this or this is what we think your movie's gonna make because you know probably that somewhere you've got investors you need to pay back. Right. So you want to be aware of your business model for future revenue, but you want your distributor just doing everything they can for the movie itself. Okay. I mean, having dealt with distributors, they always ask what the budget is. What do you what do you what should you say at that point? Um Yeah, I mean you don't want to tell them none of your business because you also don't want to come off as standoffish or difficult to deal with. Um, I mean, to, you can give them a ballpark number like, hey, I mean, it's under a million. Right. Um, you can you can sort of skirt around the issue by being like, well, our budget was blank, but we actually, you know, maybe your production had lots of resources. So like, you know, maybe it was 700 cash, but with all the sweat equity, like say you had a free cameras or free locations, it's like, it, it should be 1.5, but we were able to actually do it for 700 equity. Mm -hmm. um, so you can sort of, use it as an opportunity essentially to inflate yourself a little bit by talking about some of the strengths and assets that the production had, or I would give a, just sort of a ballpark number. Um, Cause I would hope that the distributor is only kind of asking so that they have a sense of what revenue you're hoping to see back. 
there shouldn't really be any other reason for them to ask um, unless they're trying to say, okay, in my head, I think I can make 250 off this movie. And then if you turn around and you're like, well, my budget's 700, they're like, oh, in a year or two, you are going to be mad because mm. you will not have, you know, basically turned into the black or profited. Right. Um, which I actually, you know, I had that happen at a film festival once. I went to a screening in New Orleans. It was a great film. They came up to me and they're like, what do you think? I was like, oh, it's great. I think this is going to do so well for you. Like, great. So how much money do you think I could make? I was like, I think you've got like, you know, 500 plus in revenue easy. Like, oh, well, our budget was $2 million. Hmm. And I was like, oh, okay. And for this particular film, that money was just not on screen. Hmm. I don't know where it was, but there was no talent that warranted it. There was no production elements. It was, for the most part, 10, 12 people in a house. And it was a thriller. Like, there were thriller elements, but there was no VFX. There was no special effects. There was no supernatural element. And Frank, they were like, would you work on this? And I passed because I, I did not see any path for them to be, because if your budget's too, you want to make more than that. You want to actually profit. Right. Like I want to make my money back for the investors. And then I hope that I get a royalty check where I can go buy a boat. And I just, I did not see a path to that. Hmm. There's a follow-up question from the same person. How can I get feedback about marketing and distribution and even the title as I create promo materials? Um, the, the easiest way to start is just put together a little collective of people you trust. Um, you know, I, when I'm doing it, whether it's a script or just, you know, a poster or a title or what do you think of this? I like to do a nice cross section. It's like, give me a couple actors, give me a, a couple other writers, give me a couple people that aren't in film, give me a couple people that aren't in film, but like, say, that genre. Um, if you have industry sources that you're close with, you know, you could probably skate kind of a fine line of picking their brain, like, hey, what do you think? Do you have any notes on this? I'm preparing to go out. Uh, but Again, depending how close you are to some of those people, at some point they're going to get tired of, you know, being your litmus test. So right. you also don't want to abuse or take advantage of a relationship by going to them 35 times. Right. You know, it might be the type of person based on your conversations, like, I think I've got three favors from this person and then saving them for the right time. Get it. You know, in this situation, if you're like, uh, do I pull the trigger or not? It's like, get it as close to perfect as you think it is. Give them like what you think might be the final draft, not the first draft. Right. So that their their opinion really is coming as close to the line as possible. Right. Otherwise, you have to use your community around you and just work with people you trust or respect. Right. Uh, reminder to our attendees. We've got about seven or eight minutes to uh, get your questions in uh, before we're done with this session. Um, I had an experience where I was showing a trailer for a film that I made at AFM and I would go in one room and they'd say, great trailer, we wanna see the film. And I go in another room, they'd say, need to redo the trailer, you know, we'll take a look at it. And another one where they were like, not for us. <laughs> and it was, uh, <laughs> I think that's pretty standard <laughs> when you're going yeah. from company to company to company because each company knows what they're looking for. But um, it was, uh, you know, eye opening to me because I thought it was a good trailer and, you know, it looked great. Cinematography was great. Acting was great. And uh, it was interesting to see that such a wide range of responses. You know what I mean? Yeah. Yeah. I mean, unfortunately, it's, it's a really subjective industry right. you know like you said you thought it was good somebody agreed with you and somebody disagreed and somebody thought you know maybe something technically was wrong with it and i mean getting getting tough skin is part of it um again figuring out it's like do do i respect you do i respect your company's opinion um you know one way to go about it is 
I'll go out to 10 people and sort of take all their feedback and put it in a row. And if several people say the same thing, I might give that note a little bit more credibility. Mm -hmm. And if somebody, you know, I've had for scripts, for let's say, I've had actors give feedback and they're like, well, I hated that because I didn't like the choices the character made. It's like, oh, okay, I wasn't asking you for to be morally aligned with the character. <laughs> I was hoping that you enjoyed the story and had sort of a, a real emotional reaction to it. And apparently you did because you're you're talking to me about whether or not you agree with the choices that a fictional character made in a situation. Right. So it's just have the the context of where the feedback is coming from. And, you know, ultimately it is up to you whether you take somebody's feedback or not. Right. You know, it, there's a big difference between somebody saying, if you if you do this one thing, I would like to work with you. And then you have to decide, OK, I'm willing to make that sort of compromise or that edit as opposed to, I don't want this, but I also have these notes. It's like, okay, well, if I'm not gonna work with you and nobody else has ever brought this note up, you know, it you might literally just be having a bad day. And I don't know that I agree with you. Right. So for um, a producer with a film, should they focus on marketing to the distribution companies or marketing to general audiences when they're putting together their their trailers initially to try to get distribution? Uh, ideally, if you have the bandwidth or the team, you'd like to do a little bit of both. Mm -hmm. um, distributors are always asking, is there an audience? Like, do you have social media? Like, have you gained traction? Is there any existing press or festival laurels? So it does help a distributor to see if you've actually started to make a splash in the marketplace. They're in their mind, they're essentially looking to see, is this going to be an easy job? Like you've already done almost like the testing and proven that there's something here and you've already gotten the ball rolling. But at the same time, the audience is very rarely going to be the one to, you know, walk up to you and offer you a distribution deal. So you do want, you know, that one sheet or that EPK or whatever elements you're going out to pitch the distributors because you do want them. You want to work with them. Um, but one of the tools in that kit is hopefully we have an audience. We have 40 festival laurels or 25,000 Instagram followers or whatever your thing might be um, because they're going to look at everything as a whole. Uh, to decide whether or not they really want to basically work with you because a normal distribution deal is anywhere from five to 15 years. So they're looking at, do I want to marry this person? And what are your selling points? Okay. And do you do any consulting for independent producers? Yeah, I'm, I'm always available. I've, I've acted, um, script consulting, um, you know, production elements. I've acted as the actual sales agent and sold 20, 30 films um, to distributors like Gravitas, Level 33, Epic Pictures, Terror Films. Um, so I, I, I do that when I'm not on set producing or writing and developing. Okay, so is there a website that people can find you at or how they get in touch? Um, probably... At the moment, email would be uh, the best, um, which I'm happy to share. I guess if I put it in the, the webinar chat, yep. um, everybody should see it. Mm -hmm. um, but yeah, I, I love taking a look at things. Uh, you know, I pride myself on being as transparent as I can. Um, I like helping filmmakers, um, you know, whether it's just giving them a lesson or a kernel to take with them into the future, whether we're working together or not, or actually helping empower them and getting things done. Okay. Um, it says chat is disabled and we can't see the email for Sean. I don't know why it's huh. disabled. Um, so I'll read it out to you guys. It is... 
sean at magnetboxfilms.com. That's S E A N. Right. At magnetboxfilms.com. Is that correct? Correct. Okay. All right. Well, Sean, I really appreciate you taking the time to uh, come on here and, and, and share your knowledge with everyone. Um, and, you know, people have access to, to get to reach out to you. Um, is there any final thoughts you want to leave for these producers that are trying to get their stuff out there? Uh, just keep going. It, it's hard. And in my experience, you know, it's the ones who keep going and trying and sort of banging their head against the wall, like that you will make it through eventually. It's the people who try, you know, once or twice and give up and then just blame the industry or the world at large. That it's like, well, yeah, if you give up, you're, you're never going to make it. Right. All right. Well, thank you once again. And uh, hopefully thank we'll get you. to see you soon. All right. Have All a right. great day. Have a great day, everyone. Thank you. Bye-bye.